The assembly will please stand. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Know that the Lord is God. 
our maker to whom we belong. We are God's people, and the sheep of God's Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving, and the courts with praise. Give thanks to God's holy name. Good indeed is the Lord, whose steadfast love is everlasting. Let us pray. Holy God, you have called us together from many places of life and service to worship you and to give you thanks for raising up Robin Steinke as the president of Luther Seminary. We come with deep passion for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ and with hearts full of hope for the future because you walk with us. And so it is with joy that we entrust to your care the work of this time of worship and commissioning. And we ask that your blessings would flow now in abundance as Luther Seminary marks a new beginning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of the Lord. The reading from Ephesians. I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance amongst the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord.
According to Luke. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of our Lord.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is, this is quite a day. And one reason I know it's quite a day is that I'm actually seeing some signs of life and energy from your president-elect. <laughs> I think this is the longest I've ever seen you stay in one place. <laughs> I do bring you greetings from the other, oh, I don't know, 3.8 million of us across the country and seminaries and all of, the, all of that constellation of people. Really, this is a time of rejoicing for us across the church. I know the people from uh, Trinity Lutheran Seminary are taking particularly, particular credit for this. Um, uh, President Barger, yes, <laughs> President Barger um, uh, mentioned to me as we were heading to our separate rental car agencies that it was uh, Luther's, uh, Trinity's attempt to get Luther straightened out by sending their <laughs> distinguished alum. And it's an interesting switch to have David Lowe's go east and Robin Steinke come west. But um, in God's uh, arrangements, I think it's all going to work out just, just marvelously. I know, um, Dr. Steinke, that you were involved in, in, in choosing the scriptures. Um, I, I love the passage from Isaiah. I, the whole chapter, actually, is, is marvelous. Um, and then that story from Luke is, is one of my fam- favorites. I don't know why. Because it really, it, it's not a very good um, exposition of the faith of the disciples in this. Um, though it was Easter afternoon, and they might have been really tired from that morning. I, I'm not really sure how that works. But we have this story of, of the disciples, Cleopas and whoever the other fellow was, going to Emmaus, wherever that might be. And that's not really the important part. The important part is that they were on this journey away from Jerusalem, truly believing that their hopes had come to an end. They even say that in the story, we had hoped They say this to the stranger. We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. So their hopes dashed, the burden of sorrow at the death of a friend and the death of a movement, walking away from Jerusalem to a place that no one has ever been able to find or identify. Sounds a lot like our lives sometimes, doesn't it? And they they ask Jesus, who shows up, they ask him this incredible question. Are you the only one in, in Jerusalem who does not know what's been going on in these past days? Years ago, um, at, the, at the, uh, the LCA convention, there were such things, and I'm hoping that more and more of you who are ordained have never heard of either of those things, that we are just the ELCA. But, but years ago, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury was invited as a featured guest, and he told us the story. So this was back in the 90s. He told us the story, oh, pardon me, the 80s, my goodness, the 80s, uh, the story of um, being, being in Disney World. He was there after the royal wedding, in Charles and Diana, that royal wedding. And I suppose, I guess, you know, where do you go after the royal wedding? Disney World, I don't know. <laughs> He's standing in line, which is a great sign of humility. Uh, Pope Francis probably would um, appreciate that. And uh, he, some Americans recognized his English accent. And we're, we're, you know, we just, we go gaga over um, British accents. And so they asked him, are you from England? Yes. And they said, oh, did, did you see the royal wedding? <laughs> he said, I had a pretty good view, actually. <laughs> so this these disciples asking Jesus, of, of all things, this question. And it, it, I wondered why, why couldn't they see Jesus? What, what kept them from seeing? There are various theories put forward in, in, in commentators. Some, it's a little bit like the hardening of heart of Pharaoh. So uh, Pharaoh would have to take it and, and sit up and take it and see the power of God before God's people were set free. So maybe uh, they needed to have their eyes closed so they could hear the exposition of the scriptures. But I think they just... They had in mind what they needed to see, and Jesus did not, at least this stranger, did not appear to be what they were looking for. Now, you've probably heard of this. It was a, a, an experiment carried out by the Washington Post years ago with, um, with a, a violinist in the, in the metro station there in, in D.C. And here's the story. A man sat at a metro station in Washington, D.C. and started to play the violin. It was a cold January morning. He played six Bach pieces for about 45 minutes. During that time, since it was rush hour, it was calculated that thousands of people went through the station, most of them on their way to work. Three minutes went by, and a middle-aged man noticed there was a musician playing. He slowed his pace and stopped for a few seconds and then hurried up to meet his schedule. A minute later, the violinist received his first dollar tip. 
A woman threw the money into the violin case and without stopping continued to walk. A few minutes later, someone leaned against the wall to listen to him, but the man looked at his watch and started to walk again. Clearly, he was late for work. The one who paid the most attention was a three-year-old boy. His mother tugged him along, hurried, but the kids stopped to look at the violinist. Finally, the mother pushed hard and the child continued to walk, turning his head all the time. This action was repeated by several other children. All the parents, without exception, forced them to move on. In the 45 minutes the musician played, only six people stopped and stayed for a while. About 20 gave him money but continued to walk their normal pace. He collected $32. When he finished playing and silence took over, no one noticed it. No one applauded, nor was there any recognition. No one knew, but this violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the best musicians in the world. He played one of the most intricate pieces ever written with a violin worth more than $3.5 million. Two, two days before his playing in the subway, Joshua Bell sold out at a theater in Boston and the seats averaged $100 a piece. This is a real story. Joshua Bell playing incognito in the metro station was, or, was organized by the Washington Post as part of a social experiment about perception, taste, and priorities of people. The outlines were, in a commonplace environment, at an inappropriate hour, do we perceive beauty? Do we stop to appreciate it? Do we recognize the talent in an unexpected context? Certainly, the night of Easter, the day, the third day after the crucifixion, on the way from Jerusalem to an unknown place, would be an unexpected context for the Lord to show up. So that could have been part of the problem, and I think it's part of our problem too. We don't open our eyes to see God in unexpected places, and maybe it's because as a church we need to be about spiritual practices and disciplines that make us ready to see God at work in places we never expect that to happen. But I think there's something more to this as well. What were the disciples looking for? What were they looking for in a Messiah? What do we look for? Do we want some sort of purity cop? Do we want a moral skull to whip us back into line? Are we looking for magic or a superhero? How about a cosmic concierge, right? That whole sort of transactional understanding of God, if I do this, you'll do this for me. That all happens. It happens on the left and the center, on the right and the left and the center. Are we looking for some sort of Che Guevara to forward our movement as, as the Christian Liberation Army? Are we looking for the moral superior, superiority of recycling, composting vegan pedestrians with the smallest carbon footprint who pledge to public radio? Is that what we're looking for in a Messiah? There are so many expectations that we put on Jesus or on our concept of what a Messiah needs to be that our eyes literally are closed to the Messiah God knows that we needed and the Messiah who was given to us. Jesus asks them, well, what are you talking about? And they, they explain the, the, the events that had happened and, and then he, they try to tell him what had happened and the purpose of this. They're perfectly able to quote scripture, if you know. And they even mention that the women had been to the tomb and had a vision of angels who said that he was not there, that he was risen, so they could quote scripture and the creed but they did not yet have belief. Jesus says, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And what's their answer and ours? Just like Peter the first time he heard that. No, no, we don't want that. What good, what good is there to a crucified Messiah? What good is there to have a dead Christ? What's the point of this? How will that get rid of the hated Romans, the oppression that the, that the, the Jews faced in first century Palestine? What good does that do when we can't further our own agenda, however moral and noble it might be? We don't want this crucified, humiliated man hanging on a cross. We want someone with a little power and authority. We want someone who can, who can make things happen the way we understand, understand things to happen. This passage from Isaiah, God points out 
that his ways are not our ways, neither are our, his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are our ways his ways. And that's where we get confused as individuals and as the church. Dr. Steinke, you're, you're embarking on this new adventure, leaving the beauty of Gettysburg in the spring for the wonders of St. Paul in the winter. I just, <laughs> it's amazing. You're taking up leadership to develop and form leaders for this church at a time when the church seems to be losing some currency, I think because the church sought after the kind of glory and power that the world seems to hold in, 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 in awe. But that is, not, that is not what you are called to do. You're also taking up a time when we see young people, younger folks coming to seminary. I mean, people younger than 40, I count them as young now. People younger than 50, I count as young now. And very often, these students come, I think, burning with zeal and justice. But is their zeal and justice tempered by an understanding that ours is a call to proclaim and preach the gospel, which means that we have to get out of the way so that God's work can show up? What will make our students, our leaders, different from principled, compassionate atheists? If our seminaries only put forward people who are out to do works of justice apart from understanding that our hope and our salvation, the reconciliation of the world comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus, then we're falling short. So you've got a, you've got a tough road to hoe there. It seems, it seems that we still live in a culture that is absolutely suffused in glory. That that this notion of a suffering, of a humiliated, of a dead Messiah who was raised from the, from the dead, but this, this is not compatible with the work that we need to do. We see this very often, not just in the people who are CNEs, Christmas and Easters, but too often in a theology or a, a, a culture that wants to understand that we on our own can make our lives marvelous, that it's possible to do this. And if we're going to pay any attention to the cross at all, it should be some way that all of the deadly things in this world should be gotten out of the way. If Jesus was the Messiah, if God has affected the redemption of the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus, then all the unpleasant things out there should just go away. That, that's not how this works. It's because there are still those things that are deadly that separate us from God, that separate us from one from another, that's exactly, exactly why we need a crucified and risen Savior. Too often, I think, people expect that the cross will eliminate all of the problems in our lives. But in fact, I believe the cross does something quite the opposite. I think the cross exacerbates the difference between how things are and how God would have them be and makes us more aware more aware of the brokenness in this world, not less, more aware. But because the resurrection followed the crucifixion, it's possible for us to stand in those places where there is still death and despair, where there's still brokenness. Marie Yergi, the former bishop of upstate New York, uh, bade her farewell to the Conference of Bishops last week. And uh, in that, she quoted from Philippians, her favorite passage, and it says, she says that I may know Christ and the power of his, of his resurrection. It's her favorite passage. And she says she wishes it would stop there. But it goes on. And may share his sufferings becoming like Christ in Christ's death. That, that is what you need to call forth and form in your students, these leaders. Students who see not only is it likely, but probably necessary to suffer in order that joy might, might, might abound. Jonathan Strandyard, uh, speaking to the Trinity Seminary Board a few years ago, told about his trip to the seminary in Hong Kong, which was training students to be missionaries in the Mekong River Delta. And he asked them, what are, what are you doing? How are you forming these students? And he said that the spiritual directors were working with the students to help them learn about suffering, because that that was going to be their lot. Now, we're in a culture that shies away from that. We don't want to talk about that. We've got a pill for everything. And if we don't have a pill, we have an app for everything. 
sometimes that breaks down. My GPS would not find a signal here, and I actually had to look at a map. I was, it was very disorienting, the whole process. But no, we are called to stand in those places where there is brokenness because that's where Christ already is. It's not only that Christ walks with us, it's Christ is there waiting for us. And that is something that our students need to know and embrace, that our leaders need to know and embrace. So what are the implications for us? As Marie pointed out, it's a one, one thing to know Christ and the power of Christ's resurrection. But we don't need to, sh to, to shy away from the sufferings, that we need to become like Christ in that way. And when we do that, we have to resist the temptation that especially Americans engage in, because, you know, we're such, we're such active, useful people. And that's when we encounter these things, we want to take these matters into our own hands. If the world's a broken place, well, we'll fix it, one way or the other. And we will employ our thoughts and our wisdom which we heard in the passage from Isaiah, are not God's thoughts. And we often hear from St. Paul, our wisdom is really fool is foolishness, even though this world considers the cross to be foolishness. We see in the passage from Luke that it was not enough for those disciples just to quote scripture, which they were able to do, and to cite the creed, he was raised from the dead. It took something more. It took understanding. It took, it took an encounter with the living word, which they didn't know they were having at the time. This is something, it seems to me, that has always been important to Luther's seminary. And I think in the pages, in the beginning of your, your bulletin, you even have this, your, your famous logo. What is it here? Um, V-D-M-I. Did I have that right? Right? Verbum Dei Manet Eternum. The word of God abides forever. You call forth in your students to partner or actually submit to the Holy Spirit in their preaching so that through the Spirit, the preaching of our leaders might call forth a living faith in our people. This is deeply important. And it has to happen that the students themselves have had this faith engendered in them and re renewed over and over again so that when they talk to their people in their parishes, they're not talking about the theory of Jesus. They're not talking about the philosophy of Jesus. They're not talking about Jesus, who is a moral teacher or a great philosopher. They're talking about the real Jesus because they have a real experience of Jesus, a real, deep, intimate experience of Jesus. This happens for these disciples when they recognize the Lord in the breaking of the bread. I think it's important for us to to remember that the bread was broken, just as Christ's body was broken. And it's in the brokenness that they recognize Christ, and it's in the brokenness that we can see Christ active in the world. It becomes, and here I'll get my Gerhard Ferdi quote in for all of you Luther folks here, it becomes a visible word. And that's important. People are looking for that. When people are in this country worrying about their family in Liberia, if they are being affected by Ebola, and we have members here from, uh, from Luther um, whose families are in Liberia, they don't want some theory of Jesus. They don't want uh, elegant wisdom. They want to know that the preacher believes that Christ was crucified and Christ was raised. They want to believe that the preacher has an intimate knowledge of, of Jesus. They want to believe that. When our students who become leaders stand at gravesides, they want to hear about some nice moral teacher they want to hear about a Lord who understands death because our Lord experienced death, not a theory of Jesus. I read once um, in a book called Into the Silent Land, a quote by a, a, a contemporary mystic, uh, John Reesbrook, his understanding of this, this way that the word takes hold of us, either the spoken word or the sung word, or when we see the word in the sacraments, he says, this is what should happen, this is what we understand. We should understand that Jesus enters the very marrow of our bones. He consumes us without ever satisfying his illimitable hunger and immeasurable thirst. He swoops upon us like a bird of prey to consume our whole life that he may change it into his. So yes, there will be suffering involved here. There will be a chance for us to uh, understand that we will be 
carrying Christ's cross and bearing his burden his, and tears, as we'll sing in a moment in the hymn. But there's also great and abiding joy. Not happiness, maybe, so much all the time. Happiness is overrated the way the world defines it anyways. But true and abiding and lasting joy. And this is something that, that uh, Dr. Steinke has been very keen on reminding us. I mentioned this at um, uh, Bishop Brandt's installation and Bishop Lull's installation, that she has gotten to be so tired as a, um, a seminary faculty and a dean going around to her students' ordinations to hear us bishops talk about the terrible burden of the ministry. She says, where's the joy in serving the Lord? Where's, where's some happiness? Why aren't we more like the way she is? It's not like her life has been without tragedy or tr trouble or, 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 or difficulty. But there is joy in this, true and lasting joy that the world cannot give. The passage that we had from, from Isaiah is, is bookended by two wonderful, improbable words that, the God, that God speaks to these exiles in, in Babylon. It starts out by saying, Ho, oh, everyone thirsts, come to the water. And we hear the possibility of people with no money buying and eating this promise of grace given freely and lavishly as, as a gift. And it ends with the, the wonderful words which are paraphrased in, paraphrased in hymn 726, and I'm glad you can't look in your hymnals. Well, you could, but we won't do that. It says, the hymn says, light dawns in a weary world, if you want to look at that. And love grows and hope blooms. And we hear that the trees shall clap their hands, the dry lands gush with springs, the hills and mountains shall break forth with singing. I hope, as a former band director, you're going to be sending your students out in this joy, in this joy that cannot be shaken or taken away when all of those unhappy, unpleasant things, those deadly things confront us. Now, you might not know this, that Dr. Steinke did start out as a band director, and having had the experience from time to time of teaching junior high school students instrumental music myself, I can tell you that there is no faculty meeting, there is no committee meeting, there's no board meeting to compare it with going through this with junior high school kids. So you're, you're, well, you're well on the way. And you know what? I guess we were supposed to be band directors, but maybe just of bigger bands. <laughs> but I hope and I pray in your ministry among us, in your ministry in this church, in your ministry amongst our ecumenical partners, in your ministry in the world, not only your, your activity in the Lutheran World Federation, but in your voice and in your, your witness, you will call us to true joy based on the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. True joy that supersedes happiness. True joy based on the certainty that as we were buried with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be raised with Christ in a resurrection like his. And so, Dr. Steinke, we pray that as the hymn ends, that we shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace as all the world in wonder echoes. Shalom. Amen.
Having been authorized by the church to install Robin Steinke, our co-worker in the gospel, as president of Luther Seminary, I now ask for certification of her appointment and call. After prayerful consideration, the Board of Directors of Luther Seminary has appointed Robin Steinke to be president of Luther Seminary. By action of the Church Council, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has issued a call to this office to Robin Steinke. I present this letter certifying the call. A reading from 2 Corinthians. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that the one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. President Steinke, you've been called at this time to lead Luther Seminary a learning community whose sole mission is to educate leaders for Christian communities called and sent by the Holy Spirit to witness to salvation through Jesus and to serve in God's world. What propels us in this task are the promises of God, promises embodied in the love of Christ, the one who died for all, so that all might live no longer for themselves, but for the one who died and was raised for them. Because of these promises, we no longer need to look at one another from a human point of view. In Christ, there is new creation. There is good news for the poor, the brokenhearted, captives, and even sinners good news that enables us to become, in the words of Isaiah, oaks of righteousness who rebuild ruined cities, the devastations of generations. We can embody these promises even in the midst of our brokenness and sin because God has reconciled us to God's self and to one another through Christ and in so doing has given us a ministry, a service of reconciliation. And yet in Christ, God has not only been reconciling us, but indeed the entire world, which means that our very identities and service are rooted in a witness, a word and message of promise that continually propels us beyond our own individual or communal interests into the world, the domain of God's promises, and the neighbors we find there. President Steinke, you will be leading a learning community that educates leaders of communities called and sent by the Holy Spirit to embody and announce these promises. The task will not be easy. There will be hardships, pressures, pressures and obstacles both within and beyond the seminary. Thus we pray that the Holy Spirit will give you genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God for this task. We pray that the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon you, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, so that you can indeed lead us as we discern how best to educate leaders who embody and announce these promises in the only way they can be embodied and announced, as sorrowful and rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet having everything.
the reason I'm standing here at this podium on this very special occasion is because Robin Steinke and I have been the best of friends for 28 years. That friendship began on the 2nd of November, 1986, at Resurrection Lutheran Church in Marietta, Georgia, where I was the guest preacher and Robin played a trumpet offertory. Her pastor and a former student of mine at Trinity Seminary, Kent Lang, told me before the service, this fine young lady would like to talk to you after worship about ministry. You remember it, Robin? Since then, I have been amazed over and over again at what the Lord has been doing in her life and as I try this evening to absorb in my heart and my mind what we're doing, I'm tempted to ask, Fred, are you dreaming? If so, please don't wake me up. But I'd like to take a few minutes not to elaborate on significant theological and faith themes as we've heard beautifully this evening, but I'd like to ask you for fun, but not just for fun, to play a little acrostics game with me, starting with a word that is essential for every leader in the church in any capacity, and that word is integrity. And for each letter of that word, I'll try to choose without getting too long-winded. Another word that lays out one dimension of integrity and that we can and do expect to see in Robin at Luther Seminary. Integrity, start with I. The word is intelligence. Much more than smart, much more than a cluster of degree letters after her name, of which she has plenty. Here is a mind and a heart loaded with great questions and many answers, if need be, in five different languages. Doctrine, theology, history, ethics, music, administration, finance, organization, curriculum, relationships, all of that in the package that we are being given. And in addition, a most uncommon amount of common sense. How's that for a start? Letter number two, N. No nonchalance, sometimes taken to mean indifference or the devil may care attitude, but a better synonym is calmness, non-contentious spirit. In her case, the ability to smooth rough waters, to maintain control without steamrolling, to keep her head when others are losing theirs. Third letter, T. The word is tenacity. Roger's thesaurus has many, many synonyms, including, I'm sorry to say, hard-headed. <laughs> which doesn't characterize Robin. But two other synonyms in that Sothoris are decisive and determined. Robin, forgive this personal reference. After she began seminary, her employer, a great American company with millions 
as its source and business, for whom she still worked part-time, wanted to keep her in their employ and gave her a salary offer too large to turn down. And when I asked whether she'd come to a decision, she said, not a quote, decision, Fred, that was made years ago when I said yes to God's call. Why would I ever back away from that for a few dollars? And even almost insuperable roadblocks along the path of discipleship that she had to endure and overcome, none of those could change that tenacity. I love that kind, Robin. Next letter is E. But I need an H. I've got to get hospitality in here some way. Many of you know that. But integrity doesn't have an H. So be creative, Fred. Make it essence of hospitality. <laughs> Which Robin is. Open heart, open door, open hands. Always welcoming to the campus, home, office, kitchen, guest room. And almost everyone who ever set foot on Gettysburg Seminary's campus has experienced the taste delights of her cooking and her warm response to their interests and needs. And moving to St. Paul, I doubt very much that she discarded hospitality in the process. The next letter is G. Remember Jesus' words when he first met Nathaniel? Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Guileless. That's our G. Nothing cagey or cunning or devious or insidious. Her yes is yes and her no is no. She does not speak out of both sides of her mouth. Genuine. What you see is what you get. And then comes an R, reliable. What Robin says she will do, she does. Just one little example. Editors, publishers, committees, and bishops do not have to bug her about deadlines. If it's her job, if it's her job, Robin delivers. And Jean and I have stayed in her home at times when he sp she spent appealing, devilishly appealing temptations just to give it up for the night and sleep. We saw her at it. She is a producer. And Robin, couldn't you even at this late date in my life share a little of that with me? <laughs> and now a second I indefatigable. Without this, any seminary president is in big trouble. But since it's a kind of a difficult word, I'll make one up, unfatigable. But since integrity demands honesty, we better tone it down just a bit. So let's just say almost tireless. And then a second T. This will surprise nobody. Trumpet. <laughs> Your ensembles at Luther Seminary will bug you to keep playing with them even when you have other things to do. Luther Seminary will often hear her as soloist whose notes are true, whose sounds are pure and beautiful, which is also true of all the rest of her communication, teaching, preaching, writing, not uncertain, not out of tune, 
not making it up as she goes along, but the melody and theme of her message, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Beautiful music, as anybody knows who takes time to listen. And now the last letter, Y. You want to guess what it is? Yoke, Y-O-K-E. Make no mistake about this, Robin Steinke is yoked to the Lord and to all of us who joyfully confess him as Lord. But she's especially yoked also to this faculty with a yoke enabling them together to move loads and to achieve goals and to shape leaders which none of them could do alone or just functioning independently. Together and only together can a faculty or a whole seminary fulfill its mission that we heard expounded upon so beautifully this evening. Couldn't fulfill its mission and experience then Jesus' surprising promise, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will that yoke feel heavy sometimes? For sure, but not too heavy for yoked oxen, forgive me faculty, not for yoked oxen that can lay claim to God's promise as the day, so shall your strength be. Luther Seminary, board, alumni, faculty, staff, all who pray for and support this school and all who send the cream of their sons and daughters to this place. You may never have thought you could spell integrity, R-O-B-I-N, but the whole church rejoices with you and for you as you welcome her as sister, leader, partner, gift of God. This is a celebration. So somebody ought to say amen. amen. Somebody ought to say, I'm glad to be here. Glad to no, you weren't supposed to say that. You were just. <laughs> I come to you on behalf of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I bring greetings from my bishop, Bishop John R. Bryant, Jr who is the senior bishop, presiding prelate of the 4th Episcopal District. And he told me what a great honor and privilege it was to have been invited here to speak at the installation of our new president for Luther Seminary. And I, I understood that, but I said, why me? When I talked to Dr. Kester, and he explained to me that they wanted to have someone who was both alumni and um, somebody who wanted to do it. <laughs> I said yes. But then I didn't know exactly how to handle it. He told me, he said, well, you have a couple of instructions to follow. One is to pick a couple of scripture verses uh, of your own choosing and to keep your delivery to four or five minutes, both of which for an AME preacher are an unfair requirement <laughs> to put upon us. 
But from an ecumenical standpoint, there is a verse from the Psalms, and how many of you know that once you get over 60, sometimes you forget things? And I neglected to write down the, the scriptural reference, but the verse goes, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. In the AME Church, we recite that verse every Sunday when we come together to worship. We recite that verse because we're glad to be together in the house of the Lord one more time. And because we're, somebody said amen, Lord have mercy. <laughs> amen, I thank you so much for that. Everybody should practice that. Just say amen when I say amen. Amen? amen. Thank you so much. I'm here to talk about ecumenism. Now I looked it up and some people say ecumenism, some say ecumenicism, I don't know which one it is, they're both the same to me. But when I looked it up under ecumenical, it said uh, from the Greek ecumenicos, from Greek okimene, the inhabited world, from the feminine oikumenos, present passive participle of oikane, to inhabit from oikos, the house. All of you Greek scholars can argue with me later as to whether any of that information is correct, but basically it means coming from the same house, inhabiting the same house. Ecumenical means to promote or tend toward worldwide Christian unity or cooperation. It has to do with the formation of community. One of the things that I found out while I was at Luther, in which I have heard uh, since I've been there, since I've left Luther, is that there is a movement to protect Lutheranism, to keep your toys to yourself, to keep Lutheranism Lutheran and not to necessarily bring so many ecumenical people in. And you understand what I'm trying to say. And I understood that. I, I understood that because I watched it go on with my own children. I watched as I had my oldest eight-year-old um, son uh, when we adopted our second son, he didn't like to share his toys. And because he didn't like to share his toys, we had to teach him how to share. And then when my third uh, child came along, she also was adopted, and, and they didn't want to share with her at all either because she took all, all of the attention and she was being showered with gifts left and right. And my second son decided that he didn't want her to play with his Tonka truck, and he went to take it back from her as she tried to play with it. She never said a word. She never even looked at him. She simply picked up a steel Tonka truck and hit him in the head with it. <laughs> and I said, if you can't play with your toys together, if you can't learn how to share, I'm going to have to take all of the toys away from you all. That got their attention, and they learned how to share. My children were learning, and what we have to learn in ecumenism is how to build community so that we can live in the same house and share our gifts together. Sounds good, but is it biblical? Yes, it is. He asked me, Dr. Kester, to share with you just one or two verses. I'm going to share a bunch of verses with you, and you can look them up later. I'm not going to read them. You can just take the number and read your own Bible. In Acts 2, 42 through 44, it talks about coming together. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it says that uh, as they came together, all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Ecumenism, ecumenism is about building community. And important for the Luther community in order to stand, you have to have a solid foundation that includes all communities together. And I would implore our new president to think about that as she moved forward with dealing with all the policies and questions that may come her way as the community continues to grow and expand. In the book of Acts, that sharing built relationships and it included the sharing of ideas and the sharing of family traditions, which are different from place to place among different people from different heritages. Ecumenism is about self-image. You know, you reap what you sow. Sometimes you think awfully highly of yourselves. Of 
course, I'm not talking about just Lutherans. We all think very highly of ourselves. We all think that we do things the right way and that everyone can learn from us as opposed to us learning from others. In the AME church, we have the same problem. And in our church, though, I have found out one thing. In my years at Luther Seminary, I found out that the AME church doesn't do grace very well. In our church, if you mess up, you're in trouble and people will remember it and remind you of it for a long time. I'm so glad that the Lutherans taught me about grace. And I share that with my bishop and with my supervisors all the time. Please remember grace as you uh, evaluate my performance as a pastor. <laughs> and it has served me well. But in the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter in verses two and three, there's a portion in there where it says, if you think you're too important to help somebody, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Oh boy. We seem to think that what we have is the most important and that what we have to offer is more valuable than what others have to offer us. Ecumenism is about sharing what we can offer each other. Ecumenism is about qualification. The question comes up as to whether or not these other folk are qualified to share our toys. Are they qualified? Does their doctrine measure up to theirs? Does their teaching uh, match our teaching? Is their uh, tradition the same as ours? Can they really share with what we have to offer? In the second uh, book of Second Corinthians in the third chapter, verses three through six, specifically verse five, dealing with qualifications, it says, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our, qualifi our qualification comes from God. Now you can say amen. amen. Our qualifications come from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written of laws, but of the spirit not written in pen and ink, but written on our hearts. We have a sense of sharing within uh, our own lives and being qualified. Why? Because we trust in the only one true God and we share in the only gospel that there is, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And when we decide that we're going to share, when we decide that we're going to be ecumenical, when we decide that there's no crime in sharing with AMEs and with Methodists and with uh, Church of God in Christ and with Baptists and with all the other countless denominations that are all across the world, when we finally realize that we can only grow by sharing, it is my encouragement to President Steinke that she would consider that. She moves forward and deals with all the difficulties of the ecumenical movement. You see, because Lutherans smile a lot, and you're nice folk, <laughs> but every now and then somebody does the wrong thing and you have a way of stepping to your side and talking to each other. Did you see what she just did? Did you hear what she just said? I'd like to encourage our president to remember the words from Jeremiah when the Lord spoke to him in the first chapter. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, says the Lord. To our president, don't be afraid of their faces. You're going to go to meetings every now and then and make some suggestions about ecumenical ideas and they're going to 
frown at you, don't look at their faces. Every now and then you're going to talk to people who are staunchly Lutheran about some Methodist ideas and something that you heard in the Baptist church and they're going to frown at you, don't look at their faces. Every now and then you're going to say something that is extremely Lutheran to somebody who happens to be Baptist and the Baptist person is going to frown up their face. Don't look at their faces. Do what the Lord has called you to do. And share your toys. Learn how to share with one another. And be glad about the ability to share with one another. Be glad to have the opportunity to share with one another. Somebody ought to say, amen, I've got good toys. Somebody ought to say, amen, this is my opportunity to share what I've got. Somebody ought to say, amen, God has given me these gifts. And doggone it, I'm going to learn how to share him. Lest he takes my gifts away from me, it could happen. But I only want to encourage our president to consider the fact that if you don't share your toys, you might get hit in the head with a truck. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We sing together this song from Tanzania, and let's sing the refrain always in Swahili. Jo, jo o rojo muema. The choir will begin.
Robin, in the presence of this assembly, will you commit yourself to this new trust and responsibility in the confidence that it comes from God through the call of the church? I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Will you preach and teach in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and the confessions of the Lutheran Church? I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Will you carry out this ministry in harmony with the constitutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and of this seminary, and in a spirit of communion with all God's people throughout the world? I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Will you be diligent in your study of the Holy Scriptures and in your use of the means of grace? Will you love, serve, and pray for God's people, nourish them with the word and sacraments, and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Will you give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and wisdom and compassion to perform them. Amen. I invite the faculty, staff, students, board of directors, and board of trustees to stand. Friends in Christ, will you regard Robin as a servant of God and a leader of Luther's seminary in mission? Will you pray for her, help and honor her for her work's sake, and in all things strive to work together in the peace and unity of Christ? Robin Steinke, the office of President of Lutheran Seminary is now committed to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working in you that which is pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. People of God, I present to you the Reverend Dr. Robin Steinke, President of Lutheran Seminary. Let us welcome her in the name of Christ. Thank you. I want to take a few minutes and share three words. And if I were a better writer, I wouldn't need to explain them. But since I'm not, I'll have to explain. This first word is a word of gratitude. For I am mindful today of the great cloud of witnesses in my own life who have believed in me and encouraged me, supported me, admonished me, and nurtured me, family and friends and teachers and colleagues. I am grateful for new friends and colleagues at Luther Seminary and even newer friends here at Shepherd of the Valley who have walked with us these last months in preparation for launching this new chapter in the life and mission of Luther Seminary. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for your accompaniment with us on this day and into the future. But today is not simply about a word of personal gratitude. It's also about an institutional posture of gratitude. For as I learned the story of Luther Seminary and its 145-year history, as I begin my tenure as the 16th president, I am learning the stories of pioneers in theological education. I'm learning the stories of generations of dedicated faculty and staff, of generations of students and faithful alumni, generations of generous benefactors and friends who imagined a common future in our mission of educating leaders for Christian communities. And I am struck by the resiliency 
of this institution and those who have led and served here. For there is also a collective gratitude for a board of directors and trustees who continue to exercise courage in the face of complex situations, for staff and faculty who continue to do the hard work of together imagining a sustainable future, and for our students who are learning firsthand what it means to be leaders in times of seismic change for the church. And I pray that a feature of our life together might be that we faithfully lean into the face of gratitude for those who have gone before us and for the future into which God calls us. But there's a second word, and that's a word of collaboration. Collaboration for theological education on the way to Emmaus. So often this reflection on the text from Luke moves quickly to the end of the story where Jesus is revealed in the breaking of the bread. But I want us to ponder anew the Emmaus road, the journey along an uncertain way, puzzling over matters that seem vexing. Because this text points us to the power of facing difficult questions and the possibilities which emerge in unexpected ways when we are willing to walk along the way, not only with friends, but with strangers as well. For theological education on the way to Emmaus points to making our way with both friends and strangers, open to surprises and new learning that companionship along the road makes possible. This means that for the flourishing of our mission to educate leaders for Christian communities, we may need to learn from some new friends what it means to be a community of learning so that we may be stretched to imagine a renewed future. Georg Svendrup, the second president of Luther Seminary, wrote, the communion of saints is not limited to the Lutheran church but is found outside of it and reaches far beyond its boundaries. The early roots of Luther Seminary had a hope of collaboration and openness to the world and imagined how this learning community could be stretched and strengthened with attention focused outward. 2014 marks the 50th anniversary of the large community founded by Jean Vanier. That community is one dedicated to treating all persons, regardless of developmental challenges or disabilities, with dignity and respect. I think they may have something to teach us about how we might live anew as a learning community. The hymn of the day, which we just sang, came out of that community. And it speaks of the journey with Jesus through witness, through praise, through struggle and courage. For in the face of scarcity, the response of this community is to share. In the face of despair, the response of this community is boundless trust and hope. And in the face of limits, the response of this community is unleashed imagination. David Ford, one of my teachers at Cambridge, who has deep connections with that community, notes theology, and I would add, of course, theological education, is practiced collegially, in conversation, and best of all, in friendship. And through the communion of saints, it is simultaneously pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. I wonder what a renewed commitment to collaboration and collegiality and community may open for us as a learning community and for theological education that is on the way to Emmaus. But there's a third word, 
And it's a word of hope for God's future in our work as theological educators. Though we are in the midst of turbulent times in higher education in general and in theological education in particular, I believe we have good reason for renewed hope. This is not a hope of wishful thinking that somehow the financial markets may rescue us from overspending, though wouldn't that be lovely, or that a benefactor may emerge and rescue us from unrealistic planning, though that would be lovely too. Rather, we have reason to hope, because if our mission to educate leaders for Christian communities is rooted in the risen Christ, we are invited to have the courage to tell the truth about ourselves, to tell the truth about our institutions and our frailties and our failings, as well as to tell the truth about the promise of God to be with us in the midst of uncertainty. If we are more about our call of educating leaders for Christian communities and less about preserving rigid institutional structures and ways of doing business, we just might find a renewed path together toward God's promised future. This word of hope for God's future invites us to perhaps glimpse the joy of God along the way. For the challenges are indeed vexing, and we face this in a posture of gratitude with collegial commitment to learn in new ways and from new communities toward the flourishing of life in Christ for the sake of the world. It is my great joy and privilege to begin service as the 16th president of Luther Seminary in this adventure. And I want to conclude my remarks by inviting you to join me in prayer, a, a prayer that I always emend. And it's that prayer that comes at the end of morning prayer in many traditions, but in the, Lutheran, the Evangelical Lutheran Book of Worship. And will you join me in prayer as we amend this together, as the academy prays with the church and with and for the sake of the world. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called us to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils and into joys unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage knowing only that your hand is leading us and your love sustaining us. And let the people of God say amen. amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please stand and share the peace with your neighbors. It's always hard to get Lutherans back to their seats at this point. The peace of Christ again be with you always. As we uh, proceed to our offering, I'd remind you that as it says in the bulletin, the offering supports theological education globally through the work of the Lutheran World Federation. It's a great pleasure for me this afternoon to uh, note that our brother in Christ, Elijah Zina, is here. Please stand. 
from Liberia and his wife Yama as well. They both, uh, Elijah serves with our new president on the board of the Lutheran World Federation. We're grateful that you are here today, traveling all the way from Liberia for this occasion. Thank you for uh, reminding us of our partnership in the gospel around the globe. We continue with our offering. And let us pray. Holy God, in a time of great change and uncertainty, 
in the world and in your church, we give you thanks that you have come to embrace the whole world with your love and grace. We pray especially this day for all institutions that educate leaders for Christian communities around the globe, that you would inspire and empower them through your Holy Spirit. Embolden these institutions with your wisdom and knowledge that they may form faithful leaders who bring the message of the gospel with passion and courage. Encourage these institutions with your love that they may form faithful leaders who bring words of healing and forgiveness to a world of conflict and fear. Increase in these institutions your compassion and your kindness, that they may form faithful leaders with hearts to love and with hands to serve the broken and the downtrodden. And finally, O oh Lord, strengthen President Robin Steinke and the leaders of all of these institutions. Bestow upon them your power, that they may do their work each day with deep confidence that you are directing them and guiding them in ways that honor and serve with highest purpose your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Before I proceed to the benediction, I would remind you of a time of fellowship and hospitality following this worship service. Please do stay. There has been much planning and care to welcome you to a time of fellowship. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends in Christ, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.